Friends, welcome to worship in Scarva Street on Sunday, the 17th of July. If you're joining us for the first time or are returning, it's lovely to have your company as we seek to worship the Lord together. We trust that online services will continue as usual. Our focus is on Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 42. And here we have a reminder of the importance of focusing upon Jesus. It is easy to have our focus upon ourselves or on other people rather than fixed on him. And of course, when our eyes are diverted from that focusing upon him, then problems arise. And here we see one for John, one of Jesus' disciples, and we can perhaps see ourselves reflected in that. Let's come and bring our worship to God. We sing our opening praise, How Great Thou Art.
we come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, we bless you for this time of year. We bless you for the heat, for the sunshine, for how the light reflects the glory of your creation. The blueness of the sky, the greenness of the grass, and every other colour and hue. Lord, we bless you for the ways you have chosen to reach out to us, declaring your glory. From the stars in the heavens to the insects on the ground. And Lord, everything in between, you declare your glory. And we can truly say how great thy art. But not only in manifesting your greatness in this way, but also the depth of your love to us in giving us your Son, the Christ of the Scriptures the only saviour of mankind and how we are privileged to read about him and to hear his glory declare. Lord, bless us in worship today. Help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus that we might in your mercy and by your spirit understand him more clearly and in reflection to understand ourselves more clearly too. Lord, you teach us when we pray to openly confess our sins. Cleanse us, Lord, from all that is wrong and let us know your truth within us. Hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We find our reading in Mark chapter 9 and reading from verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. Amen. We thank God for the truth of his word. Boys and girls, our story today is not just for us, but it's for everyone in the church. Our new moderator, Dr. John Kirkpatrick, has sent this little slide presentation just to thank members of the churches, ours included, for sending gifts to help the people of Ukraine. Over £1.1 million has been raised so far, and that's the largest amount ever given to such appeal from our own denomination. Our partners are Christian Aid, Tear Fund, and also the Reformed Church in Hungary, their Church Aid section. They are our partners and they're hard at work. They've been at work over the past few months distributing humanitarian aid and giving assistance to refugees and displaced people fleeing regions of conflict even including inside Ukraine itself. And the Hungarian Reformed Church has sent us some pictures. There's 
resources being packed, ready for distributing. There's a big warehouse there with so many important and needed essentials. And teams have been sent out with their vans all over Ukraine and in neighbouring countries to help those who have been displaced. There have been centres available for people to register for help. Uh, the Hungarian Reformed Church people dress in that uh, green jacket. Uh, that's their colour. And you see them there in different places trying to talk to people and help them and make sure when they're moving they're going to be safe. You see there a picture of someone with their wee dog. They brought their wee dog with them. They didn't leave their wee dog behind. Another uh, uh, Hungarian church lady in the green there talking with children and trying to help them and encourage them. And others at a train station just making sure people get the right connection. Because very often they're speaking a different language when they go to a different country and they need help. And our partner church is really helping people just to move from one place to another and to be safe. We can still make donations if we want uh, through the Presbyterian website or through sending something to the moderator's appeal. And I can get that address to anyone who would want it. If you haven't yet contributed and want to help, you can do that. And lastly, we're asked to pray. And later on in the service, we will be praying for the people of Ukraine. We're going to ask God that he'll be gracious, that he'll bring a ceasefire. There'll be a lasting peace. We want to pray for justice and stability for the country of Ukraine. We want to think of those who've lost loved ones, that they'll be comforted. And those who find themselves without homes, will be led to places of welcome and shelter. We want to pray too for our Christian brothers and sisters in Ukraine, that they'll be able to endure, that they'll be protected, and they'll be faithful in their witness to Jesus at this time. And to pray too that all the aid agencies will be able to do their work and get all the resources through to those who need it. So we will remember the country of Ukraine, not just today in our prayers, but we want to remember the people every day that God will bless them. Have another story for you next week and we'll see you then. We draw near to God in prayer with our focus very much on the country of Ukraine and the situation of the war. Let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, as we remember a people so oppressed, we thank you, O Lord, for our reaching out from agencies and other nations. And Lord, we pray that you will allow this to develop and increase that those whose plight gets all the more precarious, that they will know that there's concern and love and help coming their way. We pray, Lord, for an immediate ceasefire. We pray for an ending to the war. We pray for a lasting peace. But, Lord, we pray too for a justice in what will be a newfound stability. We pray, O oh God, that those who have committed atrocities will not go unchallenged and unjudged in this world. And yet, Lord, we know in the frailty of our own position and our inability to exercise authority. That, Lord, we are not promised justice 
in the present time. But we know that you, O God, will bring about your justice in your own appointed time. And it will be perfect. Lord, even as we pray, it reminds us of the grace in which you call us to stand. The grace of the Lord Jesus, who cleanses us from sin and allows us to be free and forgiven. Such a truth, Lord, humbles us in heart as we pray for others in need and we pray for your righteous judgment. Father, be with those who have lost loved ones, those who have been maimed, injured in mind or body. We pray for those who have seen atrocities, and pictures are ever at the forefront of their minds. We pray for agencies bringing relief, for medical staff as they seek to help those with terrible injuries. We pray, O oh God, for your church in Ukraine that at this time, as they seek to reach out with help and with the glorious hope of the gospel, that, Lord, you will write new names in the book of life through your Son, Jesus, that in heaven angels will rejoice, God at work, bringing his salvation, and blessing people. Lord, bless us here in Banbridge. Be with us with all our various needs. Touch our congregation where folk are sick or worried, troubled, depressed. Those anxious about tomorrow. Those unable to be up and about and getting out. We pray, O oh Lord, your hand in grace upon all our people in need today. Those listening in, those in our community, Lord, be pleased to touch by your spirit. And Lord, bless us as in a little moment we come to your word, we pray that we will know its teaching and Lord, that you'll bless our heart not only for ourselves, but for your honour. Hear our prayer, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, Calvin will sing the light of the world. Here I am to bow down, here I am to sing. 
to a little section in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. A short passage, and I suppose a passage that would be easy perhaps to read through and read over, because maybe not just sure what to make of it. And yet, when we look into it, we can see how at different times, we are perhaps just a bit like John. And there's a them and an us attitude that rears up in our hearts. Jesus has declared his Messiahship. The disciples are beginning to grasp who he is. But they just can't understand what he has been telling them. The Messiah is going to reign. The Messiah is going to be a great conqueror. He is going to set up a kingdom. And this, according to Jesus, is an everlasting kingdom. But yet, Jesus says he's going to die. And they really don't grasp it at all. They just, it, it's just dismissed from their thinking, this cannot be. In hindsight, reading through the gospel records, uh, uh, knowing about Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, we sort of wonder, well, why didn't they see it? He's teaching them very plainly. But if we were there, we perhaps would have thought something similar. In chapter 8, Peter's reaction is such that Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It's, in a sense, some sort of reflection in Jesus' mind as to what happened when he was tempted by the devil in the desert before he began his ministry. And then James and John in the next chapter Chapter 10, verse 35. They are asking for position in the kingdom. Jesus speaks about the cross. But they're wanting an important role and place. Not only do they not understand, but If you or I had been Jesus, we would have been exasperated. But he is gracious and he's gentle. He knows their frame and he loves them. Here, John is alone. It's not Peter. It's not John and his brother. But it's him. And he says, teacher, we saw a man driving out demons in your name. And we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Now, John himself, in his own gospel, he writes of himself as the one Jesus loved. Now, I suppose in part, that writing is is not to write his own name and moved by the spirit he's allowed to write in that way and it might give the sense of of an 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 anonymity um he just doesn't want to draw focus to himself 
Maybe this idea about John being someone very gentle. But that's not what we find in the scriptures. John is a very strong character, a very robust character, and someone who, with his brother, could be riled very easily. I say that because back in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 3, and at verse 17, we read this. Jesus, having appointed the twelve, Uh, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve. He appointed Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, uh, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Then the other disciples are named, ending with Judas Iscariot, who was to betray him. John was a firebrand with his, with his brother, a son of thunder. And here we find that John's zeal is misplaced. And that's the, the two things I want to bring to us this morning in this passage. The first is this misplaced zeal of John. And the second thing is, a question that this narrative provokes that we ask and answer. John's words, in a sense, betray him, don't they? He had seen someone driving out demons in Jesus' name. And he says we told him to stop because he was not one of us. He wasn't authorized by Jesus. He wasn't chosen by Jesus to be in this small group of followers who had been with him, who had learnt from him, who had watched him minister. And here was someone who had driven out demons in his name. They weren't authorized by Jesus to do this. Now, perhaps you can see something in your own heart there. It can be very irritating if you have a certain qualification. And yet you find someone else who isn't qualified. And yet they can do a much better job than you. I suppose we could think of a number of scenarios. Maybe someone is uh, an interior designer and they're in a building and they're they're speaking about what they would do to, to change the decor and so on. Maybe someone who just works there just says something, well, I think that would be a good idea. And it's maybe the opposite of what the interior designer is, 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 is presenting and the owner says, you know, that just seems to click. Now, can't you imagine how irritating it would be for the one commissioned to examine the building and present a, a program of refurbishment and someone who's just there says something that overrides what the expert is saying. And of course, the disciples had been powerless earlier to drive out the demon from the boy, you remember, earlier in this chapter. But Jesus is patient with John, isn't he? Jesus says, it's ministry in my name that is important. And it's not just reserved for the few, John. Here is a picture from Jesus that he is going to expand his ministry and it will be for anyone and everyone who truly owns his name. Now, we're not told anything about this man. 
But what Jesus is saying about him is that he's acting honorably. He's obviously not wanting to draw attention to himself. He's seeing a need and trusting the Jesus he's heard and asking for ministry and help to a person in need. It's faith. It's humility. It's service. That's what truly matters. But yet here, isn't there a a qualifying question? That's the second thing, not just the the misplaced zeal of John because this man wasn't in their group. But there's this question we, we feel we need to ask. Jesus makes another statement. For whoever is not against us is for us. And that makes us ask a few questions. What does this mean? Is Jesus taking a loose view of discipleship? You know, if you're not against me, you're for me. We may know a number of people who, if you asked them, they would have nothing against Jesus. But they wouldn't love him. They wouldn't want to sit under his word. They wouldn't want to live their lives by his teaching. They wouldn't acknowledge any value in the cross. They just have nothing against him. So if they don't have anything against him, is that, does that mean they're for him? Is Jesus saying those people who don't have anything against me are really on my side? And even worse, is this a window of opportunity For a person who isn't committed to Jesus, who hasn't asked him to forgive his sins or put his faith in him for salvation, is this a little window of opportunity for such a person to say, well, I'm not against Jesus. I just don't think terribly much about him, but I'm not against the man. Does that mean that Jesus would count this person as okay, as for him, because he's not against him? I'm laboring that a wee bit, but you see what I'm saying? And of course, the answer is an emphatic no. And the context makes it clear, and we must always go back to the context when we read a verse like that. Because I could imagine on a Sunday morning in church, I could just speak that verse. Are you against Jesus? Put up your hand. And no one puts up their hand. And then I say, well then, we're all for him. Heaven is our home. All is well. You don't have to worry about another thing. As long as you're not against him, and I don't see any hands up, then we're all all right. We can go home in peace. I think my own congregation would think I'd had a turn or something if I said something like that. So what is Jesus saying? What's the context? Jesus is concerned about John because John is totally negative against this man. And John is not thinking about Jesus, nor the kingdom, nor the man who had the demon cast out of him. But he is thinking about himself. He's thinking about his own position. I remember when I was uh, a young boy, well, I suppose in maybe late teens in my home congregation in Belfast. I uh, was helping out with a youth group at that time. Uh, The congregation had been vacant. The elders had asked me to take on a little youth group and I was working with that. And 
Um, I suppose in one sense, just learning a little bit about what ministry might be. And we called a new minister. He came and after the service of installation, we were in the hall and I was sitting beside another young man out of the congregation who was rarely there and didn't profess faith, had no real interest, certainly at that time, about the kingdom of God. And I remember the minister just walking around and shaking hands and speaking with people. And he was just about uh, to speak to me. And this other man beside me just got up and went in front and shook his hand and started to talk to him at great length about anything and everything. And uh, then the minister just was going on round. And I was sitting there thinking, if only he knew who this man was compared with me. He would have rather wanted to talk to me about ministry and uh, what I was doing in the church or whatever. And I've always reflected back on that and thought how sad that attitude was. And that's the same attitude of John's here. Here's someone who's not in our group. He hasn't followed you for any length of time. He hasn't listened to your teaching. He hasn't been chosen by you by name. He hasn't earned what we have earned. He hasn't endured what we've endured. He hasn't given the time that we've given. He's not one of us. Isn't Jesus saying something very wonderful and simple? The real issue isn't whether a man is in your group or not in your group, John. What matters is if this man is for me or not. Of course, the developing teaching in the New Testament in the epistles reminds us to treat others as more important than ourselves. In Romans 15, verse 7, to accept everyone as Christ has accepted them. And there's this beautiful picture of a, of a church going forward in fellowship where no one is seeing themselves as more important or more privileged than anyone else. And the focus is on Jesus. If this person loves Jesus, will I love him? If this person serves Jesus, will I love him? doesn't matter who we are or what credentials or position we may appear to have. It's whether or not we have faith, humility and a heart to serve. Now, maybe John's statement here is more than a statement. I'm not sure. It may have been a confession too. Depends how you read it. Teacher said, John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop. He's not one of us. Or it could be read this way. Teacher, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. Maybe John had reflected on what had been taught just previously about Jesus talking about a little child. And if you welcome him, you welcome me. Jesus certainly goes on to teach John very graciously. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. John, it's not casting out a demon. It's 
even giving a cup of water to someone who belongs to me, they will not be forgotten. In the last analysis, it's more important that a person belongs to Jesus than belongs to any group, any church, any denomination, any society. It's belonging to Jesus that truly matters. Here we have John with a misplaced zeal. and Maybe we can see ourselves in part reflected in that. We have seen a, a them and an us. And of course, that simply just binds us, doesn't it? We're looking for them rather than us, or us rather than them, rather than looking on Jesus. But the second thing out of this passage, not only that misplaced zeal that we need to guard against, it's a thoughtless discipleship. Because it's not a case of, if you're not against Jesus, you're for him. That's reading this little statement of Jesus out of context. He was focusing upon John and his error to correct him. And everyone needs to be careful that their discipleship is not just something in name, that their faith is not just something in name, that their humility is not just something in name, that their service is not just something in name, but that these things are real, our faith. Sure, gentle in Jesus, our humility, a heart given over to him, and a service because we're doing it for him. We're focused on Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you for this little passage, how it speaks about our focusing upon your own dear Son. Help us, Lord, to consciously do that, that ours is not to consider about a them and an us. It's not to question who belong to you and who don't. But it is to focus on Jesus and live our lives for him, trusting, Lord, that those lives will reflect something of him, that you might use those lives in your service to draw others truly to Jesus, And that we might be set free from a them and an us. And just look for people who love you. Hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Our final praise declares the glory of Christ and how he will win his people. And he will have every one in his presence forever. We sing, I cannot tell. Should seek the wonders to 
bring them back They know not how or when But this I know That he was born of Mary When Bethlehem's manger Was his only home And that he lived at Nazareth So the Savior, Savior of the world is come. I cannot tell how silently he suffered as with his peace he graced this place of tears, or how his heart. Satisfy the needs and aspirations of East and West, of sinner and of sage. But this I know, all flesh shall see his glory, and he shall reap the harvest he has sown. Some glad day his sun shall shine in splendor when he the Savior, Savior of the world is known. I cannot tell how all the land shall worship when at his bidding. The Savior, Savior of the world is King. We draw near to God in prayer. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all this day and evermore. Amen.